And our next speaker is Facundo Mamoli, who's going to speak to us about the gromov hausdorff distance between spheres. So take it away, Facundo. Thank you for the introduction, Catherine. And um, I'm happy to um, be here participating in this workshop. Thanks, Rick, for the invitation. Um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, present some work spanning several years uh, regarding um, the precise calculation of the gromov hausdorff distance between spheres and also upper bounds and lower bounds for some cases that we don't know yet how to handle. And this is a joint work with Sanuklim and Zane Smith. So the gromov hausdorff distance has been uh, used pretty widely uh, in uh, Riemannian geometry, mostly through the topology that it generates since the 80s when Gromov actually introduced it into the field. It's also been used in shape analysis as a model for notions of the similarity between shapes and data sets. And in TDA, applied algebraic topology, it's been useful as a notion of distance between data sets for expressing stability properties of persistent homology and hierarchical clustering. In the finite world, it is known that it is actually difficult to calculate. It is empty hard to compute in general, but there are some uh, optimistic results regarding parametric complexity, especially for dendrograms, the outputs of hierarchical clustering. I've been thinking about this uh, topic for a very long time, uh, essentially since my PhD time, which is a very long time ago. Uh, in TDA, again, the way or one way in which it appears is uh, through this uh, particular statement. Twice gromov fossil distance between metric spaces X and Y is bounded below by the baronic distance between the kth viatoris rips diagram of X and the kth viatoris rips diagram of Y. So uh, for the audience, uh, I mean, for the TDA uh, community, one possible motivation for the results that I want to describe today are related to how good is this bound. And in more generality, uh, also, uh, we, we, you know, the, the motivating question is how strong are the usual TDA invariants, namely barcodes. I want to say something um, very quickly. So as I mentioned um, a second ago, it is empty hard to compute gromov hausdorff in general. So the left-hand side of this equation is in general out of reach. But the right-hand side can be computed in polytime. So it is important, therefore, to know how good the right-hand side might be in relation to what we really want to estimate. So let me establish some notation. So I'm going to be considering the collection of all bounded metric spaces denoted MB. DGH will be the symbol that I use to denote the gromov hausdorff distance. And I'm particularly interested in spheres of dimension M for every possible M between 0 and infinity. And dm is going to denote the metric on the m-dimensional sphere. The metric is uh, chosen to be the geodesic distance. So S0 will, be, uh, will consist of two points at distance pi. And then for an arbitrary m larger or equal to 1, we imagine the sphere embedded in the usual manner into Rm plus 1. And then uh, we consider the inner product between two points, x and x prime, and take the R cosine of that, and that will give us the geodesic distance. And there's, of course, a similar expression for the uh, metric on the infinite dimensional sphere, uh, which we regard as a unit sphere in little l2 with the same metric. And notice that, of course, diameter of every possible sphere with uh, the choice of metric that I described is always pi. And it's also clear that a small dimensional sphere always embeds isometrically into a higher dimensional sphere via suitable choices of equators, etc. So the problem is that we want to understand this infinite matrix where each entry corresponds to the gromov hausdorff distance between Sm and Sn. So and I'm going to use the notation G, M, N, where M goes from zero to infinity to denote uh, the entry. Um, 
So let me also recall now some basic definitions and properties of the Gromov Hausdorff distance. Whenever you're given two sets, X and Y, any subset of the Cartesian product between X and Y um, will be said to be a correspondence between X and Y if there are full projections onto the two factors, pi 1 R equals X and pi 2 R equals Y. And I will use a notation calligraphic R, X, Y, to denote the set of all correspondences between X and Y. One way in which one um, frequently constructs correspondences between two sets is via surjections. If you have a surjection from X to Y phi, then the graph of this surjection phi will be an element, a valid correspondence between X and Y. And notice that the collection of all possible correspondences is always non-empty, because you can always choose this, you know, the maximal possible correspondence, the product between X and Y. And as an example, if Y happens to be the one-point metric space, then there's a unique possible correspondence between X and the one-point space, which is a Cartesian product between X and the one-point space. The next important notion is uh, the notion of distortion of a relation. If you have a relation R between two sets, the distortion is defined to be the supremum over all pairs, x, y, x prime, y prime in the relation of the distance in the space x between the two x factors and the distance in the space y between the two y factors. And notice that if we specialize this to the case in which we look at the graph of a function, then the distortion boils down to a simplified formula in which you take supremum over points in the domain x. So you look at supremum with, uh, over all possible x and x prime in capital X of the distance in x between the two points minus the distance in y between the images. And I will, yet, I will just use the, notion, the notation distortion phi to denote this. And of course, if uh, you calculate the distortion of this relation, you obtain the number called diameter, which is a supremum over all x and x prime of the distance between x and x prime. And if you look at the distortion of the Cartesian product between two sets, the maximal correspondence between x and y, that will give you the maximum between the diameters. And let me explain why this happens. Just as an example, so if you uh, write the formula for an arbitrary correspondence, you have to look at pairs, x, y in the correspondence, x prime, y prime, etc. But now if you specialize to the case when R is X cross Y, then in that situation, you no longer have any constraint over how you pick X, Y, X prime, Y prime. So you're really taking supremum over X, X prime in X, Y, Y prime in Y of this difference. But now this entry is bounded below by zero and bounded above by diameter. The same thing is true for this. So hence, uh, I can bound this difference by the maximum between the two diameters. But then you can prove that actually you can attain the equality here by making suitable choices of x, x prime, y, y prime. So hence, please remember that uh, you all, this, this will be used throughout the talk, namely that and the distortion of the Cartesian product is always uh, the maximum of the two correspondences. The gromov hausdorff distance, uh, between two bounded metric spaces is defined as the female distortion of any correspondence between x and y multiplied by a one half factor. If you're interested in knowing why the one half appears, appears here, please uh, ask me at the end and I'll be happy to, 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 to remind you of that. Now, uh, Gromov actually uh, in the 80s uh, proved that Gromov also distance is a pseudometric on the collection of all bounded metric spaces. And furthermore, if X and Y are chosen to be compact so that gromov hausdorff between them vanishes, then they must be isometric. Are there any questions up now? Okay, so here are some simple bounds for a gromov hausdorff distance between spaces. First case, if you uh, have a subset of a given metric space, a subset P, then you can regard P as a metric space by endowing it with a restriction of the metric on the ambient space X. And then we wonder what is the distance between P and X, the ambient space. One can prove that this is always bounded above by the house of distance between X and P. 
And of course, this is telling me that I can reduce the left-hand side by making P cover X more efficiently. The distance between X and the one-point space is actually one-half diameter. This follows from the calculations a couple of slides ago. And then we also obtain that the distance between X and Y is always bounded above by one-half maximum of the diameters X of X and Y. And this will be useful later. So here's one uh, recipe that one can think of for how to construct possibly useful correspondences between two given metric spaces in the case that uh, concerns me uh, today in this talk, namely when I have um, one metric space which admits an isometric embedding into a larger metric space. So for example, spheres. And uh, as I mentioned before, one way of uh, constructing uh, correspondences is to construct surjections. So in this case, I'm going to attempt uh, to construct a surjection from y to x with low distortion. So how do we do that? Well, first we pick a natural number k, and then we pick a partition p of y minus x. I'm, I'm going to assume, actually, that x is a subset of y for simplicity. So pick a partition of the complement of x inside of y into k blocks, b1 to bk. And then for every block x1 to xk, pick a corresponding point, any point, in x. And then define the surjection to be the identity on x. And then send the whole block bi to xi for every i. So this is a picture. Now, if you write down what the distortion of this surjection will be, well, you have to break the analysis into you know, all the possibilities, all the possible combinations. And one of them is, what if I pick two points here? In, inside the same block. Well, if you pick two points inside the same block, they are sent, they're gonna be sent by the subjection to the same point xi. So hence, in the formula for distortion, the dx part of uh, the formula will vanish, and you're going to be left out with uh, the diameter of that block. And then there will be more complicated interactions between the different choices you made, but it's useful to remember that uh, at least you're going to pay the maximum diameter of all the blocks that appear in your partition of the complement of x inside of y. So again, the, the problem, uh, we want to estimate different, um, the different entries into the matrix. And this leads naturally to searching for upper bounds and lower bounds, and eventually trying to shrink the gap between the upper bound and the lower bound. So the first trivial upper bound is given by the knowledge that all diameters are equal to pi. So hence, all entries into the matrix are bounded about by pi over two. So what about some lower bounds now? Well, let me jump back quite a few years into 2007, 2008. Around that time, I proved uh, uh, a lower bound via curvature sets for the distance between the one dimensional sphere and the two dimensional sphere. And that lower bound was pi over 12. It's not relevant for the talk today what this means, but let me just uh, say that that's the best I knew uh, these many years back. Now, uh, back then I was a postdoc uh, with Gunnar and uh, we, we used to have a the PDA seminar. And um, I, I gave a talk and I presented some work related to this. And then Gunnar was there and also a fellow postdoc, Tigran Ishkanov. They were both in the audience. And then they both suggested topology as a possibility, you know, to, to try to enrich my analysis uh, with, by considering some topological ideas. And Gunnar suggested actually more precisely that, well, why not try to use persistence? Uh, I mean, some ideas will lead to persistence to improve the bounds that I have. Tigran, however, was uh, suggesting, well, if you're looking at spheres and maps between spheres, you, you surely should think about Borsukulam. And yes, I had thought about Borsukulam, but I immediately uh, became a little bit pessimistic about applying Borsukulam because, uh, you know, in Borsukulam all the maps ought to be continuous and also antipod preserving and there's nothing that imposes that in the definition of chromo -fausto. So let me tell you about the first attempt that did follow uh, regarding utilizing persistence for finding lower bounds. Actually, a year before that, I had already started collaborating uh, with Chassal, with us, uh, Udo Kohensteiner. And, and we, we proved this theorem, uh, the stability of persistence that I mentioned at the beginning. And 
of course, I mean, the, the, the first idea would be to say, well, let's specialize these two, as, let's say S1 and S2, and then, well, to estimate this, let's estimate that, lower bound that. But then, back then, around that time, uh, the seminal paper by Adams and Adamasek regarding the full characterization of persistent diagrams of S1 was not yet out. And uh, I would need that, right, to implement the idea of plugging here, the, say, the DGM1 for S1 and S2. However, we did have some software that allowed us to play with this. And I, the initial, I think, a package that was available to us was Plex. And that one was fairly slow. At some point, uh, Holland Sexton and Michel, uh, they developed JPlex, which is a precursor to JavaPlex, which is the one that I think is fairly well known nowadays. And experimentally, I noticed that, well, uh, say for a few hundred points, or I think that's the most that I could handle back then, the one dimensional diagram of S2 looked empty, very tiny bars all over the place. And the one dimensional diagram of S1, the circle, seemed to contain only one fairly important bar. And nowadays we know that that bar is zero to two pi over three. So experimentally, therefore, I was led to believe that G12, the distance between S1 and S2, was a lower bounded by the result of calculating one half of the baronic distance between the empty diagram and uh, this diagram, the one corresponding to the GM1 of S1, S1. And well, uh, this is pi over six, which is better than pi over 12. So I became partially happy that I obtained some improvement over what I knew before. And after a few years, maybe three, four years, I don't know, uh, I was actually able to prove that uh, the degree one diagram of S1 contained this bar. And I remember that it was fairly useful to find a paper written, a very early paper on persistence intersected with stats, uh, written by Peter Buenik and Peter Kim. It appeared in HHA in 2007. And then it was not too difficult actually to convince myself that this also had to be true by a simple subdivision argument. So hence we had back then this lower bound for a G1N. Uh, that is the distance between S1 and any n dimensional sphere, pi or six. And eventually around, I don't know, may, may, a few years later, uh, there was like a, another proof, I mean, much more complete analysis that actually gave not just one bar, but many other bars. Now, none of this was actually ever published because I, I was unhappy that I didn't know at least ex one exact value for uh, the distance. And anyway, so let's talk about uh, the possible uh, approach regarding persistent homology. Now. As I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, G1N, well, we were able to obtain some information for, for that regarding, uh, sorry, coming from pH. But what about G2N? Now, if I want to use the same strategy, then I should know what is a two-dimensional diagram of uh, spheres. And frankly speaking, I, 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 I don't remember uh, you know, knowing much about that. And, and I think that most people were rather baffled by, by the question back then. And actually, uh, up to nowadays, we only have partial information about that. Much of that information was, has been found by Henry and collaborators, but the full characterization of the persistent diagram of spheres is uh, still open up to this day. So around 2007, I was searching uh, for information regarding Vietoris ribs complexes. I wanted to uh, learn more about that and, and see how they had been used uh, you know, saying in geometry group theory, et cetera, and that's what people were saying, right? That they, there have been some use uh, of these ideas uh, very early on by uh, Ilya Rips. And at some point I, I hit a paper by Laschev. And then I noticed that uh, Laschev actually cited a paper by Hausmann that was earlier. And it took quite a while to find that paper, but eventually uh, I, uh, I found it. And there's a theorem, the, the, the main theorem in uh, Hausmann's paper, implying that the Vietoris Rips complex of uh, implying this, it's more general than what I'm going to say, but it implies the following. The epsilon Vietoris Rips complex of uh, an n dimensional sphere, uh, it's a geometric realization, it's homotopy equivalent to the sphere as long as you restrict epsilon to the range from zero to pi over two. So that allows the following calculation via the stability of persistence. Now, this tells me 
the Hausmann results, uh, Hausmann, uh, the, what, what Hausmann proved tells me that the M degree M diagram of SM will contain a bar zero delta for delta at least pi by two. And that will be in, you know, say more modern language, the bar generated by the fundamental class of the sphere itself. Now, also, if N is larger than M, and if it happens to be true that the M diagram of SN contains a bar alpha beta, then alpha cannot be smaller than pi by two, again by this result. Okay, so then invoking stability of persistence, you get that GMN will be bounded below by one half, baronic distance between these two things. But, uh, well, by analyzing, you know, the possible cases that appear here, you, you have that uh, this will be bounded below by pi by eight. And the eight comes from this one half and this pi over two divided by two coming from the persistence of this bar. So in total pi by eight. Okay, so this was pretty good, but still no knowledge of a particular uh, exact value. And that, that was somehow something that kept, kept us going for some time. Now in 2016, 2017, uh, Sanyu Klim, Osman Kutan, and I, we connected somehow the uh, notion of the Torres Rips uh, persistent homology with a so-called filling radius uh, notion that Gromov had uh, investigated many years back. And essentially the, the, the connection is the following. If M is a Riemannian manifold of dimension M, then the degree M diagram of M will contain a bar starting at zero and dying at two, twice the filling radius of M. So what is the filling radius? So the construction of the filling radius is the following. So suppose that M is your manifold, you can isometrically embed the manifold into L infinity of M via the usual Kuratowski embedding. So then you have uh, this map, Yota epsilon, that is inclusion map from M into the epsilon ball uh, around M in L infinity. So this picture here takes place in L infinity of M. So you have M, the image of, well, you have the image of M under the Kuratowski embedding. You thicken that by epsilon, and then you consider inclusion of M into that thickening. So then you look at the map induced by this inclusion at the level of uh, top homology. And then you ask a question, what is the minimal epsilon that manages to kill the fundamental class under the inclusion map? So that is a number that appears here. The next uh, interesting finding uh, is that also in the 80s, Michael Katz managed to compute the exact value for the filling radius of spheres. And what he found is that the filling radius of the M-dimensional sphere um, equals exactly one half the diameter of the uh, regular geodesic simplex embedded into SM. And this is a precise formula for that diameter. Our cosine of minus one or n plus one. So this uh, geodesic regular simplex in SM has n plus two points. For example, for m equals to one, you have the vertices of an equilateral triangle, and then zeta one is two pi by three. For m equals to two, you have four points, realizing a regular tetrahedron, and then zeta two is this number here, the r cosine of minus one over three. And notice that zeta m um, decreases monotonically down onto pi over two as m increases. So Katz furthermore stated a result which implies the following. And this is an improvement over what Hausmann, uh, what we obtained by Hausmann. So namely that the uh, realization, the, the geometric realization of the epsilon vitoris rip complex of the M dimensional sphere is homotopy equivalent to the M dimensional sphere as long as you pick epsilon in the range zero to zeta M. And as I said before, zeta m is always bounded below by pi by two. So this is an improvement over what Hausmann had done. So we are then able to utilize a stability of persistence in the same way that I described before to obtain a slightly improved bound. Where now instead of writing pi by two here, which is what comes out of Hausmann, we have this number zeta m. And this is true of course for every n larger than or equal to m. 
And uh, when m is equal to one, this uh, reduces to uh, pi by six, which is what uh, had come out of doing things by hand for the case of a circle. Okay, so time passed, and uh, I, uh, in 2013, I joined Ohio State, and then uh, at Ohio State, uh, I met uh, Sanyuk and Zane, and both uh, got, in, uh, got interested in this question, so they joined the project. And then there was a breakthrough around 2016, uh, when we were able to actually construct the correspondence, um, providing an upper bound for the Gromov-Farsos distance between S1 and S2, better than pi by two, which is a cheap upper bound that arises simply by uh, considering diameters. And this, uh, uh, this uh, correspondence uh, was approved to have distortion to pi by three. The correspondence is actually easy to explain. So consider a sphere S2 divided into two parts through an equator and call that equator S1. And then for the top part, divided into three equal parts passing through the North Pole. V1, V2, V3. Notice that each of these parts will have diameter 2 pi by 3 because it's also dividing the equator. And then divide the bottom hemisphere by uh, the, the, the reflection of V1, V2, V3, the antipodal, uh, you know, the, the antipodes of V1, V2, V3. And then on S1, pick uh, U1, U2, U3 vertices of an equilateral triangle and then send V1 to U1 v2 to u2, v3 to u3, and then uh, send uh, the antipode of v1 to the antipode of u1, etc. And then we define, defined, well, I, I should say that what we did back then was a slight variant of this. What I'm saying, what I'm describing today is a, an improvement upon that. Uh, but, but anyway, so uh, this allows, uh, we define a subjection from S2 to S1 so that on the equator is just um, the identity. And, and then, well, you use the recipe that I said before, V1 goes to U1, V2 goes to U2, et cetera. And so we have a subjection, and we should point out right now that this V2, 1 is antipode preserving, simply by construction. And that right now is not relevant, but it will become relevant in a few minutes. And then we prove that actually the uh, distortion of phi 1, 2, phi 2, 1 um, is equal to pi by 3. And by what I, the recipe that I showed you at the beginning, you know that when you compute distortion of phi, at least you will detect, you will see, you will have to contend with the diameter of the blocks of the partition, v1, v2, v3, minus v1, and all of those have diameter this much, which is 2 pi by 3. That already provides a glimpse into why it might be true that, uh, that you know, that the, actually the distortion was 2 pi by 3. So, um, the, the proof is um, a little bit involved, but it's just simple uh, checking multiple cases. Okay, so again, some notes that the phi to one that we found is antipode preserving. And uh, now if we concentrate on the distance between S1 and S2, up to now we had an upper bound of pi by three and the lower bound given by persistence uh, and, uh, of value pi by six. So we had a gap. And of course, I mean, we tried many different things to reduce the upper bound, to increase the lower bound. But at some point, uh, we started thinking about uh, Tigran's suggestion, Borsukulam. And even though it sounded at the beginning like really uh, far-fetched, uh, you know, we decided to give it a try. I mean, maybe um, just to explore if anything would come up. So these are two equivalent statements for the Borsukulam theorem. In the first one, we are guaranteed that um, if you fix n, you will not be able to find any continuous and antipode preserving, uh, anti preserving map f from Sn to Sn minus 1. And the Leuchternik Schneiderman uh, theorem tells us that if you happen to um, have a close cover, of this n-dimensional sphere by n plus one sets u1 to n plus one, then there must be one element of the cover containing two antipodal points. Okay. So the Eusternik Schneiderman uh, theorem has a very direct application for uh, calculating precisely 
the distance between the zero, zero dimensional sphere and any other sphere of dimension different from zero. And I, uh, the, the conclusion will be that the distance is actually pi by two. So we already know this upper bound. This is just the diameter upper bound. So all we need to do is to prove the lower bound. Okay, pick any correspondence R between the zero dimensional sphere and the n dimensional sphere. The zero dimensional sphere is just two points. So then look uh, all the points X that are related to P, one of the points in the sphere. And take the closure of that. That will be UP. And then I'm gonna construct UQ in, this, uh, UQ in the same way. I'm gonna look at all the points X that are related to Q. And take closure, that's UQ. UQ. So then I have a closed cover of this N by two elements. N is larger, N is large. So then the starting Schwinnerman tells me that I must have one of these two contain antipodal points. So hence the diameter of that will be pi. And by the expression that I showed you before, coming from the recipe for how to construct uh, correspondences, we know that the distortion will have to be bounded below by pi at least. And hence concluding that G0n is um, equal to pi by two. Using the same argument, we can prove something slightly better. And suppose that P is any finite metric space with cardinality at most n plus one. So then um, it will be equally easy to prove that the Gromov Faust distance between Sn and P has to be bounded below by pi by two. And as a corollary, we have the following lower bound for the uh, M GMN for general M and N, namely that uh, this is bounded below by pi by two minus the covering number of order n plus one of the smaller dimensional sphere, the M dimensional sphere. And so how do we do this? Well, we write distance between SM and SN, we apply triangle inequality passing through P. And we choose P to be a subset of SN, SM, the smaller dimensional sphere with the correct cardinality N plus one. And we furthermore choose P to be optimal in the sense of minimizing the house of distance to SM. Namely, we choose P realizing the covering number of degree n plus one of SM. So hence we have that this distance by the proposition above will be bounded below by pi by two. And now this one, as I showed you at the beginning, is bounded above by the house of distance between SM and P, because I chose P to be a subset of SM, but then that house of distance is equal to the covering number of degree n plus one of SM. Okay, this has an immediate application. It's not difficult to prove that the n plus one covering number of a circle is exactly pi divided by n plus one. So then by the corollary in the previous slide, we have that GN, G1n bounded below by pi by two minus pi divided by n plus one, which is this number. So we have something mm, that looks non-trivial uh, as an estimate for the distance between uh, the one dimensional sphere and the n dimensional sphere a certain function of n. And notice that this function, when n is equal to, uh, say, uh, two, will become pi divided pi by two, and then, I see, yeah, pi by six, which is what we had before. And also as n increases, well, as we, I guess, would uh, intuit, this uh, uh, um, converges to pi by two the upper limit for our distances. And by using a very similar argument, we can also prove that the distance from any finite dimensional sphere to the infinite dimensional sphere is pi by two. All of these, uh, these two results actually uh, follow very directly from applying the lift turning Schinnerman uh, theorem. Okay, so this is a summary of what we have so far, or what we had so far in 2017 or so. Uh, we, know, we knew that the distance between the zero dimensional sphere and the n dimensional sphere was equal to pi by two. And this followed from the LS theorem. And also the distance between the infinite dimensional sphere and any finite dimensional sphere was pi by two. From the diameter bound, we knew that a generic entry into the matrix was bounded by pi by two. And by applying persistent homology and then some results by cats, uh, uh, yeah, be, uh, um, re regarding the, the precise value of the, uh, compu the computation of the precise value of filling radius of spheres, we had this number. And 
this number translates into pi by six for a case of uh, the one dimensional sphere versus the two dimensional sphere. And then by an explicit correspondence, we calculated um, this upper bound for G12. So a question that came up during that time was, well, how good is this upper bound? In particular, we wonder, could it be that for some finite m and n, uh, that g m n is equal to pi by two, pi by, uh, to pi by two? And this, this is some, somehow an easy question that we decided to tackle. And given that mm, there was a partial success in estimating things via uh, Livstonian Schirman, we thought, well, maybe you know we should keep our uh, focus on topological methods and see if we can answer whether this is true or not. And Borsukulam tells us that it is not possible to find a continuous antipole preserving map from a high dimensional sphere into a low dimensional sphere. But what about the opposite? What, are, what about the reverse Borsukulam? So what if I try to find a continuous map from a low dimensional sphere into a high dimensional sphere, which is antipole preserving and subjective? It's kind of a, a crazy thought a priori. I mean, but what if we could? Well, um, it, it so happens that yes, we were able to find such a map and that such a map allows us to prove that all the entries corresponding to finite indices must be st strictly smaller than pi by two. So the sort of a reverse for Sukulam is not difficult to prove. I'll show you a sketch in a minute, but before doing so, let me uh, describe uh, how to apply it for concluding this strict bound. Okay, so consider um, the uh, graph of uh, the surjection, which is antipole preserving, from the low dimensional sphere into the large dimensional sphere. It is continuous, right? So first of all, distortion of this uh, correspondence will be equal to the supremum, ignore the max for now, over xx prime in the low dimensional sphere of this difference. But now, because phi is continuous, the maximum is attained. I can forget about the supremum, write max. So then I can pick x0 and x0 prime in SM attaining the maximum. And the first observation is that these two points cannot be equal. Well, suppose that x0 and x0 prime were equal. So when you plug that into here, you get zero. But then I'm assuming that M and N are different. And I found a correspondence with zero distortion. That's a contradiction, okay? The next case is what if x0 prime is antipodal to x0? Well, in that case, the distance here between x0 and x0 prime is pi, and the distance between the images, because the map phi mn is antipole preserving, is also pi. So then again, we have that, we found that correspondence with distortion zero, and that contradicts that m is different from n. So the case that remains is that x0 prime is not equal to the antipode of x0. Well, in that case, it must be, therefore, that the distance between x0 and x0 prime is contained in the open interval 0 to pi. And that is already enough because the distance between the images will be in the perhaps closed interval, but that doesn't matter. Still, the distortion, because you have to, you, know, you will subtract numbers from here and here, the distortion of this correspondence will, will be strictly bounded up by pi. And this concludes the proof of the corollary. So how did, did we prove this, uh, I mean, reverse uh, kind of Orsukulam result? Well, the, the construction is not difficult to explain. So again, we look at um, the sphere, we break it into two parts through an equator and look at the top and break the top into four equal parts, V1, V2, V3, V4, and then on the circle, on S1, divide the circle into eight equal parts, A1, A2, A3, A4, then minus A1, minus A2, minus etc. And then map each of these intervals in S1 via space filling curve into the corresponding VI. And this is a picture, a cartographic picture of S2 and well, you know, your, and do this for all, for the top part of S2 and then reflect the map to define what the map will be on the bottom part of the sphere. 
And this does the job, at least for the case between S1 and S2, and the more general construction relies on spherical suspensions uh, interpreted in a geometric sense. Anyway, so, so far, what we, we have is in, in the following slide, and what changed uh, with respect to the previous time I showed you, is uh, that now we were able to improve the non-strict inequality into a strict inequality. So hence, it cannot happen ever that for any pair of n and m finite, that the distance between the m-dimensional sphere and the n-dimensional sphere is equal to pi by 2. It must be strictly bounded above by pi by 2. And what I want to um, point out so far is that the successful constructions that we had were essentially two. And when I say successful, I mean successful constructions of upper bound. As I mentioned before, uh, we obtained this upper bound for the distance between the one-dimensional sphere and two-dimensional sphere by pi by three through an explicit construction of a surjection which was antipode preserving. And um, this uh, little improvement, uh, you know, let, let me call it an epsilon improvement here, uh, was done also via the construction of a surjection which was antipode preserving. So then we uh, went back to thinking, okay, so what is the most uh, we can get out of these uh, type of topological ideas? It's sounding like slowly we are able to exploit antipode uh, preservation. And anyway, so we had not yet been able to do much with this. But um, this um, theorem tells me that, uh, I will reiterate this, sorry that I'm being repetitive, but it is impossible to find a continuous and antipode preserving map from the uh, high, uh, high dimensional sphere into a low dimensional sphere. But, you know, when we really wanted to try and use uh, something related to Warsaw Kulam because um, we had obtained at least partial success by pursuing those ideas. Okay, so then we, at some point, we thought of the following. Suppose that you do have a map which may not be, which is not continuous, a phi from a high dimensional sphere as n into, you know, skipping one dimension, s n minus one, and assume the map is subjective and say antipode preserving. Well, the Borsukulam tells you there's no way this map will be continuous. But then the question that came to our minds was, well, maybe it will help us to uh, understand how this continues, must this map be, and maybe we will be, we will be able to exploit that somehow. And uh, I remember, and, and today actually I checked these details, I think uh, very in, in, in early 2017, uh, Henry Adams came to Ohio State. And Henry, uh, I, I forget what he spoke about, uh, I think I, I, I forget exactly. I remember there was something about the metric thickenings. But at some point after the talk, uh, he was sharing with us uh, that he had been working on a Borsukulam type of uh, theorems and some relaxation of the theorem. And also, maybe some other colleagues suggested, uh, you know, this book independently, like, you know, for, for other projects, it would be an interesting book with a lot of uh, collected examples. And during the summer of 2017, I was reading the book and um, at some point, uh, I was, uh, you know, we were, I read the book ex exactly keeping in mind that, uh, you know, this resonance of ideas and trying to find Borsukulam type of results that would help us in the Gromofaus project. And then I was reading very carefully that book and I, and, and I saw a, an exercise, section 2.3 of the book, that points to a 1981 paper by Dubins and Schwartz, something related to uh, uh, a quantitative version of uh, the, the standard Borsukulam theorem. And, and now let me tell you uh, that statement. So if you have any map F from a topological space X into a metric space Y, uh, you can define the modulus of this continuity of the map F uh, as follows. So delta F will be the infimum over all the delta so that every possible point in the domain admits an open neighborhood UX with a diameter uh, so that it, the diameter of it, its image is bounded up by delta. So this is a picture. So you have a point X, you have UX, and then you map by F, and then you may split these things apart, but then you want to make sure that the image uh, doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't expand more than delta. It's not larger than delta in, you know, in the metric of the ambient space Y here. And the theorem that they had proved uh, the paper appeared in the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, 1981, 
Uh, and what I'm gonna state now is a corollary, the, the corollary that was useful to us is the following. So if you do happen to have a map F from Sn to Sn minus one, which is antibody preserving, you must have that the modulus of this continuity of this map is bounded below by zeta n minus one. And remember that zeta n minus one, well, zeta n was the diameter of the regular geodesic simplex in Sn, given by that formula. When, when we found this, we immediately had the um, impression that uh, it would be useful to us. And it took some time uh, to uh, solve it, maybe a month, and then uh, Sanyuk was thinking about it, and he came up with the following um, beautiful sequence of arguments. So, and uh, suppose that you have uh, n and m, m smaller than n, and you pick any correspondence r between Sn and Sm. So then the claim is that the distortion of this correspondence must be bounded below by zeta m. And here's a sketch of the proof. For simplicity, let's assume that n is two and m is one. So then uh, decompose the sphere as two into the union of two disjoint pieces, two helmets. And uh, it's not super easy to give you uh, in, in real time uh, a description, but I think, uh, you know, a mathematically precise description, but I think uh, it's not uh, difficult to see what it means in, from the drawing. So take uh, the hemisphere, say the top hemisphere, and we obtain A by taking away part of this half of the boundary. So you will contain this, contain that, contain that point, but then you have open, an open boundary here in this part. So this is a view of A from the bottom. And of course, A and minus A are disjoint, and you can obtain S2 as a union of these two, say, and the helmet, and it's a reflection. All right, here's a sketch. Assume that the correspondence R is such that its distortion is bounded by zeta one. Then you can always pick a function from S2 to S1 so that its graph is contained in the relation in the correspondence R. So then you verify, and this is not too difficult to do, that the modulus of this continuity of F is always bounded above by distortion of the function F. So, so far we have a map from S2 into S1 with modulus of this continuity smaller than zeta one. We are almost at the point where we can apply Dewins and Schwartz result, but the map F may not be antipole preserving. So then we create a new F, F tilde, which will be antipole preserving and will have distortion, distortion uh, not, not larger than the distortion of the original map F. So how do we do that? Well, we define F tilde A first as a restriction of F to the top helmet, and then define F tilde as F tilde A on A, and the reflection of F tilde A on the reflection of A. So this map will be antibody preserving, then you check that the distortion of F tilde doesn't exceed the distortion of F, and then you have the following uh, chain of uh, inequalities. Modulus of this continuity of F tilde bounded by distortion of F tilde, which is in turn bounded by the distortion of F, which we assume to be bounded by zeta one, contradiction. So hence, this must be true. So immediately, the corollary is that this provides a much better upper bound for, um, well, say, uh, an upper bound which is twice better than what we knew before for some cases, but now applicable to all uh, pairs of finite dimensional spheres. The upper bound is one half of zeta m as opposed to one fourth, like we obtained by a persistent homology. In particular, now we close the gap for the case of S1 against S2, and uh, we were happy that we now knew precisely that the chromophasal distance between the one-dimensional sphere and the two-dimensional sphere was pi by three. And this, of course, uh, shows that the surjection we constructed uh, before was optimal. So let's uh, modify then this diagram. So before we had this lower bound uh, arising from persistent homology, and when translated into the case of m equals to one, that gave us pi by six, that did not match pi by three, but now thanks to the quantitative version of Orsuculum, uh, we have an upper bound equal to the lower one here, and we improved uh, the, uh, say, generic lower bound by a factor of one half. So in this setting, it turned out to be that 
uh, for two coulomb type of ideas that were uh, more effective than persistence. Now, uh, I, I wanted to yeah, make some comments about this uh, theorem by doing and Schwartz that we found in the literature. As I mentioned, it appeared in the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, 1981. And I checked again today, apparently it's been cited only six times uh, since then. And the proof, uh, when you look at it carefully, uh, it relies on the standard Borsuk Coulomb theorem in some place. There's a paper by Weiss in 1989, Israel Journal of Mathematics, where uh, the author provides a combinatorial proof of the standard Borsuk Coulomb and indicates uh, or offers a, at least a critique to this other paper, the one by Dewins and Schwartz, exactly because they rely on the standard Borsuk Coulomb and suggest that maybe another proof could be found. And we actually did write a, a more succinct proof of the theorem by Dewey and Schwartz by following some ideas outlined in, in Matushek's uh, book in the exercise uh, that uh, I alluded to uh, before. So before the end of the talk, I wanted to quickly uh, summarize uh, other results that we obtained. We were also able to obtain, well, first of all, so remember that I said before that uh, GMN was always lower bounded by one half zeta m. So in particular, you can plug here m equals to one, and then you have that one half, two pi by three, will always be a lower bound for G1n. So we did deal with the case of n equals to two, so then it's interesting to think of n equals to three. Can we construct a correspondence R to three with distortion, uh, you know, two pi by three? And if we can, then we have also sandwiched uh, G13 between two equal things, two equal numbers. And yes, the answer is we were able to construct such a correspondence, optimal correspondence between S1 and S3. And the construction was actually also uh, fairly interesting. And uh, the, the moment that you, well, I mean, so for someone who uh, has been exposed to uh, some, some um, ideas in topology, if you think about S1, S3, S2, et cetera, then you may think of the Hobbes map. And that's uh, an idea related to the Hobbes map was actually what uh, ended up the construction uh, succeed. And in a nutshell, the idea was the following. So uh, we constructed um, a suitable map from S3 into S2, uh, product with some other parameter space, zero to pi, uh, somehow inspired on the Hobbes map. Uh, they're, they're not the same, but there was uh, certainly the inspiration of going down into S2. And then the, these, these pictures will be uh, able to convey the main idea. So um, th this is this a purple uh, disk is supposed to represent S3. You have a point Q on S3, and first you map it down into S2. So you obtain a point P sub Q. And now uh, also uh, part of uh, in our construction, we have this uh, arrow that tells me how to take PQ and convert it into Q. So now this arrow is functorially mapped, say let's say it's mapped into an arrow on the circle, and then this point PQ is mapped onto the circle to U1, if U1 is a map that appears in phi to one in the correspondence that was, op uh, in the surjection that was all op optimal for the case of S2 and S1. And then you move this U1 through this, the corresponding arrow to that one. And that gives me a map from uh, the three-dimensional sphere into the one-dimensional sphere, uh, which we prove to be uh, optimal, namely to have um, the distortion to pi by three. And finally, by a construction that was structurally very different from those for the case one, two, and the case one, three, we also uh, managed to uh, construct a correspondence with a distortion bounded above, above by the, uh, say, optimal, a, pre, a posteriori optimal number, zeta two. Hence, uh, clarifying uh, a little bit more about this uh, infinite matrix. So this is supposed to summarize the results we have. Uh, this is a, a better picture uh, depicting the infinite matrix uh, that I uh, motivates the research. So green here means that we know the precise value. Um, orange are the maximal values that you could attain. And uh, finally, uh, on, on the supra diagonal, we have the zeta m over two. And uh, then uh, in blue, we have some lower bound that arises from the covering number and then the strict upper bound pi by two. To conclude, uh, the conjecture, we believe that um, the supradiagonal entries will be equal 
to uh, this number, zeta m over two. And we have a question, suppose that uh, m zero is a fixed number, and then look at the map from n into g m zero n. Is it true that as, as you increase n, you decrease down into pi by two? We don't know that. It seems like an obvious question to pose. And then as you uh, move away from the diagonal, at some point, uh, you must you know, start increasing, right? Because you know that you reach pi by two eventually. So then what is the first time when you should not paint this by purple, right? What, what is the first time when you exceed the value that appears or we conjecture to appear on the supra diagonal? And we have some clarity regarding that in the case of the one dimensional sphere. And, and, and of course, I mean, uh, it's interesting to try to extend some of these ideas to uh, other spaces or maybe still spheres with uh, different metrics. The paper was submitted to the archive um, yesterday, I think, and should, should, be, uh, uh, should appear actually uh, publicly in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you so much, Facundo. Are there any questions at this point? Wonderful talk, Facundo. I'll, I'll ask a question. I was wondering if you could explain um, the question, I think it was 2A again, it was about sort of this non-decreasing property. So um, the question is if you, I guess if you fix a row or fix a column, eventually do the entries all start um, behaving monotonically non-decreasing, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, 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 that's, 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 that's not sort of immediately implied just because like the 17 spheres contained in the, inside the 18 sphere, that, that's not the case you're saying. No, it, it doesn't seem to imply directly, you know, so some other idea might, might be necessary there, yeah. Interesting, thanks. No, no problem. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.